All right, well, welcome everybody to Cersei Summit Lightning Room uh, 2. And uh, today we have four uh, wonderful presentations that we, we played sequentially on a, um, without, it, without interruption in between. And uh, I'll, I'll introduce all of the talks, uh, talk titles and speakers now. And they're all joining us live. And as soon as the uh, presentations are completed, we will and we will have a Q&A for approximately 20 minutes. Feel free to send in your questions through the Q&A function. Uh, so I'll, I'll begin by introducing uh, the first speaker. I'll actually introduce all the speakers. First speaker, speaker is William Bentley, Professor of Bioengineering at the University of Maryland. Uh, and I, don't, I won't read all the talk titles because you'll see them uh, at, in each of the presentations. Charles Chu will be the second speaker from the professor, his Professor of, of Laboratory Medicine at UCSF. And then we have two speakers from CDRH, Doug Kelly, Deputy Director for Science at CDRH and FDA, and then Ed Margarison, uh, who's Director of the Office of Science and Engineering Laboratories also at CDRH. So at this point, uh, we will begin with uh, Dr. Bentley's presentation on uh, COVID responses. Hello, everyone. I'm Bill Bentley. I'm the Director of the Robert E. Fischel Institute for Biomedical Devices at the University of Maryland. And what I'd like to do is provide my own personal reflections on our Institute's response to the COVID pandemic. Uh, the Institute was launched in 2019. So in just one year, we were immersed in, into, a, in, into an effort that uh, enveloped the entire region as well as the nation. Um, I'll show you a little bit about the Institute a little bit about a case study in which we developed from idea into commercial product and N95 equivalent uh, respirator, conformal respirator, and then reflect a little bit on our pathway forward. So of course, the reason that I'm here is that I'm co-director of our Maryland Searcy. Uh, our PI is Jim Pauley from the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences. Uh, in our 10 year history, our CERCI has engaged in research with the FDA uh, jointly, of course, in drugs, biologics, and devices, but also in women's and minority health, tobacco, and the spans pre and post market. Our institute in particular is very interested in workshops and training and scientific exchange and over a series of 60 more or more uh, workshops, we've enlisted 15,000 participants from industry, academia, and the government um, participating in uh, scientific exchanges revolving around FDA regulated products. And then finally, we also uh, run, sponsor a Who's Got Regulatory Science talent competition in which undergraduates and graduate students are inspired by understanding regulatory practices of the FDA and contribute uh, to their understanding and just think about these practices, which otherwise they might not other, uh, participate in. I'm also the co-PI of the National Capital Consortium for Pediatric Device Innovation, which is one of the FDA's PDC member institutions. Ours is led by Children's National and is joint with MedTech Innovator. Our institute is a research institute on a big state university campus. So in that context, does like many research institutes, brings faculty researchers together in a thrust area addressing uh, societal challenges. Unlike many uh, research areas, ours deals with uh, products that would be regulated by the FDA. And so ours also deals with the translation of the idea into the commercial sector. And so this deals with reimbursements and clinical trials, as well as market assessment, intellectual property, capital investment, and so on. In order to enable this, we created what we call the Fischel Foundry. And this is essentially a series of uh, five very talented energetic engineers, each with particular expertise, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, bioengineering, et cetera, materials. Uh, where we provide a, a way in which an idea can be developed into a prototype, a functioning prototype that would be sufficiently attractive and, and, and working uh, so that it can attract commercial investment, venture investment, et cetera. 
We also immerse startup efforts in an ecosystem that uh, exposes people to uh, regulatory processes, uh, 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 market potential, intellectual property, reimbursement, et cetera, as I've mentioned. Um, and so when we started to uh, encounter the COVID, and this is unfortunately a plot of the US COVID regulated or uh, related deaths. And, and I focus in on early 2000, where there's a big spike. And, and of course the cases were far more than deaths. As a nascent director of a nascent institute, uh, emails started flying. And I actually went back and found some of my emails and I'm not going to go into these because I don't have time. But one of the things that I'd just like to convey is that there was a huge number of very kind, capable individuals, smart individuals that wanted to contribute. And most of those individuals had no idea about contributing in a way that was related to health and the betterment of health. Do no harm. And so on that little chart there, you can see the University of Maryland is in the middle of a huge assortment of regulatory agencies, national labs, uh, medical, biomedical research uh, areas, institutions. And ours as the major college of engineering in the area was a focal point for developing additive manufacturing or other engineered solutions to the pandemic. And so one of the first things that we did was to mobilize with the city of Baltimore, a series of testing booths that are sort of like phone, phone booth type structures. We built five of these jointly with Johns Hopkins University and deployed these in different regions in the city of Baltimore. And you can see on the, on the uh, URL site, this was all done prior to June of 2020. And so a practitioner could test an individual from the public without being exposed in an air-cooled environment, an aseptic environment. Uh, and, this, and these, as I mentioned, were deployed. But what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit more about a, a more involved story. And here, we were already doing CERSI related research with CDRH on additive manufacturing. In this case, there were two topics. One, toxicity. Is the ink pre-printing uh, still non-toxic post-printing? This is something that needed to be developed and, a, and a, a huge array of data needed to be generated. Then second, many of you realize and recognize the sort of granularity of 3D printed products. There's this porosity question. Are, is that granularity a, a nice place to provide wettability and a place for biofilms to be created, et cetera? So we were already working on this with the FDA. The University of Maryland had previously invested very substantially in 3D printed and additive manufacturing. So we have an array of expertise among those people in the Fischel Foundry. We were also working with a company in Colorado, Active Armor, that was uh, gearing up for and getting into practice of making splints and casts 3D printed. The advantages are numerous. You can see right through it. You can take a shower, et cetera. And so we worked with Active Armor to think about, hey, could we develop a PPE solution, a conformable respirator, conformal respirator that would be comfortable, reusable, washable? A clinician could take it home at night, wash it, put cartridges in uh, to, for the next day and reuse that, uh, wear it for an extended period of time without irritation. So we developed a workflow and then we tested extensively in the design, build, test uh, paradigm of engineering with an array of clinicians, engineers, and the institutions that are indicated. In the end, in about six months, our designs were transferred over and again, sort of modified for a more upscaled manufacturing environment and subsequently sold by Active Armor. They're no longer in this business, 
but they were for a critical period of time. And that showed to us that we could do this kind of effort, design, build, test, establish a clinical relationship, establish manufacturability, get into the marketplace as an institute just about a year and a half old. We also invested in testing equipment. Obviously, if you're gonna have these kinds of devices, you need to test those and make sure they're safe and effective. We purchased some test equipment from an ATI, a Maryland company, evaluated the University of Maryland's provided KN95s to the campus, evaluated testing for the state of Maryland Attorney General's office, and we currently have spin out projects underway that I hope to give you an update on next year. So in conclusion, I think what we did as a, as a nascent institute was that we first provided sound judgment, practical guidance. We built a clinician practitioner, university manufacturer, FDA network of individuals. I think very importantly on a college park campus where most of the research in the institutions of Maryland are in Baltimore, uh, health-related research. Uh, we grew a health-related awareness on the campus and that outpoured into the region. And very importantly, we established credibility for the Fischel Institute going forward. So I'd like you to invite you to our website, send me an email, follow us on Twitter. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Dr. Charles Chu. I'm a professor in the departments of laboratory medicine, and medicine, infectious diseases at University of California, San Francisco. I am also the director of the UCSF Abbott Viral Diagnostics and Discovery Center and associate director of the UCSF Clinical Microbiology Laboratory. The title of my talk today is HIV Genomic Surveillance in Cameroon, Africa by Next Generation Sequencing. So there are two specific aims for our project. Uh, the first is to use agnostic metagenomic NGS assays to sequence and characterize HIV genomes in plasma from HIV positive individuals. Uh, these genomic sequences um, are, will guide the development of CBER reference panels to evaluate the performance of serologic HIV antigen antigen antibody combo and nucleic acid assays. Uh, this is a project that's done in collaboration with Dr. Indira Hewlett's lab um, at CBER. Uh, the second aim of, the, of this project is to perform metagenomic next generation sequencing of plasma samples from patients with undiagnosed acute febrile illness and blood donors from Cameroon. Analysis of the sequencing data will allow characterization of the human blood virome and also enable detection of uh, potentially um, emerging um, singly infecting or co-infecting uh, viral pathogens that may be present in these samples from both HIV positive and HIV negative individuals. Uh, this is uh, a slide taken from a, um, uh, a review paper that I wrote a few years ago. Uh, it goes over some of the conventional target enrichment methods for viral genomic sequencing from um, metagenomic libraries. Um, uh, probably a, a very common method for, uh, for viral genomic sequencing is the use of PCR amplicon sequencing. Uh, this was used, um, has been used, for instance, for SARS coronavirus 2 sequencing uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it uses specific primers and probes uh, to amplify uh, regions of the viral genome. Uh, another method is using uh, biotinylated uh, probes in combination with strepavidin magnetic beads for target enrichment, in this case, viral genomic enrichment in metagenomic libraries. Um, if you don't do any enrichment, which is called direct metagenomic sequencing, um, it has a clear disadvantage in that you end up sequencing mostly human host background DNA or RNA. Um, so some sort of enrichment is typically needed for viral genomic sequencing. Um, at the same time, however, for this particular project, we wanted to also be able to leverage the power of metagenomic sequencing uh, in order to be able to comprehensively detect other viruses that may be present in these samples. Um, so what we did for this project is we adopted a yet another technique that was developed in my laboratory called MSSPE, or metagenomic sequencing with spiked primer enrichment. Uh, this technique involves a, a simple modification in during the reverse transcription step. We actually spike the metagenomic libraries with uh, specific viral primers in addition to random primers. Though these spiked primers enable viral enrichment of targeted viruses in the metagenomic libraries. Um, so uh, we published this a few years ago, and you can see here, uh, we were able to uh, produce anywhere from roughly a five-fold to 20-fold enrichment uh, viral reads in uh, clinical samples from infected patients infected with a number of different viruses, including chingunya virus, uh, Zika virus, dengue virus, Ebola virus, and yellow fever virus. 
But of particular relevance to our current project, uh, we were also able to show that you can obtain enhanced viral genomic coverage uh, using the MSSP technique. Um, for instance, uh, if you look on the top row, we're able to um, improve the coverage from 23% with standard managed genomic sequencing to more than 92% with uh, MSSPE. So the MSSP technique is what we applied for this particular project. Uh, the, the library preparation protocol, which you see here, is actually adapted from a clinical managed genomic protocol for pathogen detection and infectious disease diagnosis that was developed in my laboratory that we run at UC San Francisco. Um, it involves um, uh, extraction uh, using, in this case, an automated extractor like the Kingfisher instrument you see there, followed by a series of enzymatic steps for reverse transcription, uh, amplification, and library preparation. Um, and then we generate about 40 million reads per sample, and we analyze them using a pipeline which was developed in my laboratory called SERPI, stands for Sequence-Based Ultra-Rapid Pathogen Identification. Uh, and the turnaround time for this protocol is roughly about 24 hours. Um, this uh, gives you a, a look at kind of the inner workings of SERPI. You can see that it has a number of different steps, including pre-processing, background subtraction, alignment to uh, comprehensive microbial databases, and then provides results along with a graphical visualization interface. And so I wanna quickly go over some of our results. We did receive uh, roughly 100 um, high, uh, moderate to high titer um, cultured HIV virus uh, that were spiked into a, a, a biomatrix. And we prepared sequencing libraries for uh, uh, genome recovery uh, and assembly. Uh, we also received 262 plasma samples, 257 from zero surveillance from Fairbell individuals from Africa, and we processed uh, roughly 95 to date. Um, this is, uh, shows you uh, kind of a SERPI view. You can see that it basically looks like a heat map, and you can see that we can detect HIV-1 in all of the samples. We also detect reads from other viruses, such as uh, GBVC or uh, human pegivirus C. And you can also see that uh, we're using SERPI plus software, we can assemble the entire genome uh, directly from the reads. Um, so this can occur if you have very good coverage. Um, in lower titer samples, we've been developing other um, reference-based assembly workflows. This gives you an example of how we can further analyze the data using two different assemblers in addition to SERPI, which includes SHIVER, which stands for sequences from HIV easily reconstructed, and IVA, iterative virus assembler. Uh, these are reference-based assemblers um, that can take any number of reference HIV genomes and use them to basically generate a, um, a consensus assembly uh, with uh, high accuracy. And ultimately, the goal of generating these genomes is that we can also also do uh, quasi-species analysis as well as phylogenetics and to be able to look for recombination events in addition to the genotyping identification that would be needed for establishing these uh, CBER reference panels. Um, um, I don't have time to really go over the details of Shiver, but this is a, a slide taken from the paper that describes kind of the technique which involves uh, alignment of the HIV reads assembly into de novo assembly into contigs, and then comparison of that with uh, reference-based uh, sequences of HIV. Um, in addition to that, we can also look at the metagenomic libraries for uh, presence of viruses. Uh, this is looking at the RNA libraries, and I, I want to highlight some other viruses in addition to HIV that we have managed to detect in the samples. Uh, one includes uh, a spumavirus. Um, so the specific virus is actually Macaximium foamy virus. And interesting, this was found in, in a sample from one individual. And interesting enough, it has previously been reported that these viruses, which typically affect macaques, um, have also been found to affect certain humans, especially um, uh, humans who may be exposed to uh, non-human primates, such as Central African hunters. In addition, we also detected the presence of several other viruses. Um, this gives you another example. This is human rhinovirus C, which among all human rhinoviruses is actually the one that is thought to be invasive, has been detected before in plasma, whereas most rhinoviruses cause respiratory infections. Uh, this one has been linked with more severe disease, including sepsis and febrile illness. Um, in addition, we've also detected uh, reads from several other intriguing uh, viruses in these clinical samples. Um, one sample had uh, reads from human polyomavirus 3 or KI polyomavirus. Uh, this was initially described in children who had um, febrile diarrhea. Um, it's unclear whether it actually causes diarrhea, though. Uh, we also detected reads from a Murray Valley encephalitis virus, which is a zoonotic flavivirus that's spread by mosquitoes. Um, we're doing further workup to see whether there's a clinical correlation with the detection of these reads. 
Um, we've also detected reads from a canine parvovirus um, in a sample, as well as reads from a divergent orbivirus, which typically does not infect humans. Uh, this, these are real viruses uh, related to blue tongue virus and changuinola virus. So, so we're doing further workup uh, of these hits in addition to processing the remaining samples. So a summary of our results to date, we've now um, analyzed and recovered the whole HIV genome from a number of different HIV cultures uh, to as for generation and validation of these CBER reference panels. We've also performed metagenomic nectarine sequencing, both DNA and RNA have identified um, several potential viral uh, co-infections. Uh, still to do include finishing the uh, genome assembly of the HIV cultures, genotyping and recombination analyses, as well as the identification of additional viral contaminants that may be present in those um, reference uh, samples, um, as well as metagenomic sequencing of the febrile illness samples to identify and characterize uh, um, viral co-infections and perhaps emerging viruses. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge uh, the people involved in this work uh, from my laboratory, uh, Venisa Relita, who is a clinical laboratory scientist and bioinformaticist, and Dr. Alicia Sotomayor Gonzalez, um, who is a DBM and PhD. And we've done this in collaboration with uh, Dr. Indira Hewlett and uh, Dr. John Xin Zhao um, at the FDA CBER. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge funding from UCSF Stanford Searcy, uh, the US FDA, uh, the NIH, CDC, as well as a number of philanthropic foundations for this work. Uh, thank you for listening, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Hi, my name is Doug Kelly. I'm the Deputy Director uh, and Chief Scientist of CDRH, the Medical Device and Diagnostics Branch of the FDA. Um, I spent 30 years in the venture capital business doing early stage um, life sciences investing, so I have a, a kind of a deep understanding of the, of the innovation ecosystem. Uh, and Jeff brought me on about a year and a half ago uh, to help him basically fix the innovation ecosystem, make the FDA more efficient, a better place to work, but also something that, that generates um, better characterized, safer and more effective medical devices and gives patients more choices. Um, so it was a pretty compelling job. So uh, I moved here uh, to the DC area about a year and a half ago. And uh, the centerpiece for all this is the Medical Device User Fee Act, which I'm gonna talk about. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here uh, so you can see. And um, uh, the first bunch of slides I have are not really relevant to anything other than background information, so I'm gonna skip over them. And uh, we're gonna talk about um, uh, Medufa, really. There we go. So we're on the fifth, um, uh, the fifth generation of Medical Device User Fee uh, Act. And, um, and we're gonna talk about that, but first let's talk about FDA's public health mission. Uh, we're here to ensure patient access to safe and effective medical devices, but it involves several things. One is ensuring, which means we have to have a consistent um, decision-making infrastructure. Uh, we need to provide access to patients of these technologies. But so just making it through the FDA uh, and not end up getting uh, commercialized because of other things that are interfering, we are not, we're not really satisfying our public health mission. And these devices have to be safe and effective. Um, and so we need evidence. And in fact, you know, the FDA is an evidence processing machine. And it's, it's second to none. Uh, we have the world's greatest regulatory uh, decision analysis infrastructure, uh, something that we should be really proud of. Um, we're also the first institution that most innovators come to that actually ask for proof. You say you want to sell this claiming X, Y, and Z, well, prove it. Um, and we're the latest to see the neatest and newest um, uh, proprietary novel technologies. And the scope and breadth of products that we see at FDA is incredible. It's way beyond what they see at CEDAR and CBER. Um, so we need to be intellectually and organizationally nimble. Uh, and these technologies constantly change. So we have to be in the field seeing what's coming up and how can we be ready to meet them, uh, whether it's in digital health or man machine interface or whatever. So we can uh, uh, provide guidance to again, safe and effective medical products. Um, right now, MedTech is, in the United States dominates MedTech, but that's only now. Uh, competitors are breathing down our necks. There's a crisis in MedTech innovation. It's too expensive. Uh, it takes too long, and there's too much uncertainty in the process. As a result, there are, you can count on one hand the number of early stage venture funds in the US that, that spend the bulk of their time doing MedTech investing. Um, 
And part of the problem is that there's too much risk, there's too much uncertainty, and the FDA contributes to that. But there's also a bunch of other stuff we're going to talk about that. Also, for the big companies, the cash cows that pay for their R&D, well, they're moving overseas where manufacturing costs are, are less. Um, and there's some other reasons for that, and I can talk about that later. Um, and FDA approval does not guarantee market access because there are all kinds of other stakeholders who have their own evidentiary requirements. And we're going to talk about that and how we might bridge that. So one of my favorite quotes from Martin Luther King, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. And that is absolutely the case with the med tech ecosystem. So Jeff and I did a whiteboard thought experiment after I joined and asked like, if we could just read, do it all over again, what would we do? How would we do it differently? I said, well, imagine that you had like a Sherpa or a, a guide that held your hand to you through the entire development process at FDA and made it as efficient as possible. And you could communicate to the FDA just by picking up the phone and get somebody on the phone and get your questions answered right away. Um, and what if not just for us, but you could come to FDA and everybody else at the same time in one place and find out what they want. And sure, what do you need? You know, patient groups, what endpoints do you find really valuable? What product features do you find interesting? And for professional societies, what do you need for coding? What do I got to show you? What's going to make you guys give us overwhelming support and incorporate us in the practice guidelines? Um, what if development timelines were really well understood? So you could honestly go to an investor and say, this is going to be a three-year process, or this is going to be a seven-year process. There's something where you just understood what it was. Um, what if you could combine everybody's evidentiary requirements into a single clinical study that you could roll over into a durability study or, or something where you didn't have to start over all the time? It's super expensive. Um, and what if you got people interested in med tech investing instead of software or internet because you could do well and it was not so risky? Um, what, what if uh, devices, what could you do to make devices better characterized? Um, what, what if you had more companies out there selling more things um, that were safer and more effective than what's out there today? And what if patients had a lot of choices? They could decide, this satisfies a bunch of my needs, but it's too expensive. Maybe this is a better fit for me. Um, where they have, again, you can only do that if you have access and choices. And that only happens when things become commercial. So the Medical Device Use Fee Act has been focused really on this part of the this um, product journey, the customer journey, from idea all the way to adoption. And we've done a pretty good job at it, but we could do a lot better because what happens is that even though companies make it through the FDA decision, they may find out later on that in fact, there's all these other things that you have to do and you can't finance that. And they end up having a fire sale with some big company. The venture investors decide they'll never do another tech deal. And then the, uh, the founders are never getting financed again because their company blew up. <coughs> so, excuse me. Um, you have the FDA, providers, payers, patients. These are all stakeholders that have legitimate reasons for the evidence requirements that they, they have. Um, what if you could bring them all together and talk about it? And so to do that, we decided to create something called TAP, the Total Product Lifecycle Advisory Program, where you bring FDA review teams, patient advocacy groups, provider networks in, uh, in professional societies and insurers together and have everybody have a dialogue about what do you need? And then you develop this rapid response capacity at the FDA so you can get your questions answered right away. Um, so it's not this, we have a pre-sub meeting, there's a long pause, 60, 90, six days, six months, a year, and you come back and have a second set of questions and you end up with this problem that I've had before where you could do that. You don't really understand what the FDA wants. You have three things that you could do. Instead of waiting for a response, it's cheaper just to do all three things. But that was just crazy and wasteful. What if you could just pick up the phone and call somebody? What if you could have a dialogue? What if you talk to this person every day, like you talk to a relative or a business colleague or, or a spouse? Um, and if you kind of said something wrong and you need to walk it back, well, you're only walking back a day of discussion. You're not walking back six months of discussion. Uh, and having to reevaluate everything. And you have this meeting of the minds. That's, that's the goal. And so these advisors, these TAP advisors, are your hands on guide of the FDA. They convene stakeholders. They bring together technical experts and they coach you on general requirements and you know, what do you have to submit? How, what form does it have to be in? And who needs to see what and when you're going to do that? 
is another way of looking at the same problem. It's, it's bringing everybody together early on and not late, so you don't have these late failures. And you don't have a problem like this, where you do your FDA study and then to satisfy some, you gotta rework it. Maybe that doesn't work. You have to do a new study, you have to finance that. And that's really hard to do. It's much better to do something like this. It's cheaper, um, it takes less time, uh, and it's much easier to understand. So the idea, again, is to make it so um, in this process with these tab advisors, the program allows you to go through this whole thing, bring everybody together, bring all the risks from late stage to early stage, and decide if this is a project that's worth tackling. You don't want to, you want to figure out if it's not working when you've invested a couple million dollars and not $100 million or $300 million. So uh, that's the way it works in uh, software and internet. Uh, and that's the way it should be working in the med tech uh, world as well. And that gives patients choices. And they, because everybody's been involved in deciding what evidence is needed, the devices are better characterized and, and de facto safer because you know more about them. Um, and, and everybody's happier and uh, we live in a better world and the FDA is, is, uh, is living up to its potential. So that's the idea behind TAP. Happy to answer any questions about it later on. Thank you for your attention and uh, uh, talk to you soon. Good afternoon. And thanks very much to the UCSF Stanford CERSI for giving me the opportunity to talk with you today. My name is Edmar Jerison. I am the director of the Office of Science and Engineering Labs at CDRH. And I'd love to talk to you today about some of the work that we've been doing in making our regulatory research more public and I think much more useful for upstream innovators. Firstly, a quick introduction to OCEL. For those of you who don't know us quite so well, we have about 150 scientists who are engaged in regulatory research in about 20 program areas or so. As you can imagine, we make a lot of presentations and publish significant numbers of peer reviewed publications each year, very active on standards and conformity assessment committees. And we participate in approximately a quarter of the pre-market regulatory reviews that are principally conducted by our colleagues and friends in the Office of Product Evaluation and Quality. Our work is split into about 20 science programs at this point in time. Um, we don't follow the same sort of structure as you've seen in our colleagues at OPEC, principally because a lot of the work that we do is really related to a larger number of product areas. So we do have some regulatory research in specific product areas, such as cardiovascular and orthopedic devices. But we also participate in things that stretch across a lot of those product areas, such as additive manufacturing, AI machine learning, biocompatibility and toxicology, and some of those other base uh, programs that are more um, technology related rather than product related. So that gives you a breadth of some of the things that we do. But our fundamental aim is to ensure that for upstream innovation, the technology development and the rate of that, which is accelerating over time, is kept in sync with the rate of evaluation of that technology. Because as those things get out of sync, then it means that it's very difficult to assess a technology, both for developers and innovators, as well as for our reviewers. And we believe that having a set of evaluation tools can actually drive innovation in a particular area. And the more that we can drive technology innovation, then we believe we will get a lot more products that are spun out of a fundamentally sound technology. We've recently made much more public what we call our regulatory science tools. And essentially, these are methods or approaches that help assess either the safety or effectiveness of an emerging device, or more importantly, we think an emerging technology. We want to try and push these into the public domain as early as possible. And what we really think they, the use of these is, is in very early stages of technology, before things like consensus standards have even been conceived of. Those consensus standards can take a long time to actually come to fruition and gain consensus. And we're trying to help innovators at the very early stage before anything else is available for them. We're really focusing on four types just for convenience. We do a lot of work with virtual and physical phantoms, and recently we've been doing 
and publishing a lot of work, for example, in photoacoustic imaging. We have a very, very extensive and multiple programs in the areas of computer modeling and simulation and their related data sets. And indeed, our organization was the first one to uh, publish a fully in silico clinical trial about three or four years ago. We're also trying to make a lot more lab methodologies significantly more accessible for early stage innovators. And in this particular example I'm using, um, having uh, more standardized testing methodologies for extractables and leachables, which is a fundamental part of biocompatibility assessment, the more we can standardize those sorts of methodologies, the more we're all singing from the same hymn sheet. We also believe that regulatory science tools can really involve our suggestion of best practices on how to do things. And you can argue that some of our methodologies would fit into those areas, but we're also trying to make specific information available to innovators and early stage developers. For example, we've been recently publishing a lot of information about the safety summaries for specific materials that are commonly used in medical device manufacturing so that manufacturers can make a more informed choice on what would be a better material for a specific application. Reg Science tools fit really into a family of tools that can be used for evaluation. The ones that I've been talking about really are at a very upstream side, uh, upstream part of the process and are likely to be developed in parallel with a novel technology. As technologies become more used and spin out multiple products from that technology, then we can consider medical device development tools, which are tools that have been qualified for regulatory use. And that means that as they're used within a pre-market application, our reviewers will have fewer questions to ask because we have already qualified that tool for use within a specific and defined context of use. And of course, we very much uh, understand and in, are very heavily involved in the development and use of recognized consensus standards which have for many years really been the backbone of standardized assessments. The big use we believe for regulatory science tools is really in that early de-risking of technology development. We want innovators to be able to think about how good their innovation is and not just how well it's tested. And the more that we can get people using those same things, then that is overall going to drive predictability in product development and the eventual pre-market review by FDA. One of the key steps that we have taken is to make a lot of these reg science tools publicly available. We've published now uh, getting close to about 150 of these. These are all available at the FDA website and I've put the URL here for any people who want to go and take a look at those. It's certainly not exhaustive at this point in time um, and we are going to be adding to this month by month as we move forwards. So where does this all take us? Um, the theory is great. Uh, one of the things that we really need to do is to build significantly higher capacity in the system. FDA regulates uh, on the device side 233,000 types of medical device. So clearly 150 tools are not going to be enough to really have a big impact. So we'd like to throw down a challenge to the whole of the community to start developing other tools that we think could be useful. We absolutely believe all of this area is very much a team sport, and that's why we value our relationship with the CERCI so highly. Um, we think that we can actually extend a lot of this now, and we're challenging all organizations to start developing regulatory science tools of their own. In the future, we're looking to add some of those tools into the ones that we have on our website. And one of the things that has very much struck me as someone who's ex-industry is that those tools certainly have an intrinsic and very much a tangible value. And in the fullness of time, we would love to see the development of a whole market based on a set of people who are going to be developing tools. And on the other side, we have product developers who are very much on the side of using those tools. So I very much look forward to any questions and answers, and of course, the discussion on all of this that we're going to have in a day or two. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers. Uh, 
I, I'm Cole Dave Singh. I'm one of the organizers of this meeting. Uh, I'm joined by Michelle Tarver, MD, PhD, a, a physician scientist who works at CDRH. She's deputy director of the Office of Strategic Partnerships and Technology Innovation at CDRH. Michelle is going to lead off the Q&A. Please send us questions in the Q&A section. We, we have about 20 slightly more than 20 minutes, and I look forward to hearing from, from uh, everyone who's on, uh, on the Zoom call. Thank you very much, Koldo, for that very gracious introduction for allowing me to co-moderate the session with you. Um, we heard from all of our speakers and through their fantastic talks about how innovation, both the methods, the approaches, the um, structure that allows for innovative solutions to reach patients most efficiently. And I wanted to start first with um, one question that we received. Um, and before I do, I again want to remind you all to please submit your questions to the Q&A button uh, in the chat. Um, the first question we have is, all of you have touched about on these different methods of collaboration, um, technolo technology development and pathways that can lead to improved public health outcomes. Could you each share with the audience one lesson you learned in the process of implementing or developing your approaches? And if we could start with Dr. Bentley first. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Yes. I can, okay. So, so um, I, th I think I should couch my response in saying, uh, reminding everybody, being a being an engineer in a in a in a leadership position on a big state campus, um, I think there are a lot of similar uh, colleges of engineering um, that might not have a perspective of the FDA and what it means to have products that are developed and regulated by the FDA. So, a lesson learned in my case is don't fear reaching out to folks uh, at the FDA. I think. You just heard, we just heard excellent presentations that said, you know, pick up the phone. And uh, so a lesson learned in my case is definitely take advantage of that. Uh, and then also don't uh, find yourself going down a rabbit hole. So always keep a, uh, a mind on what is important for the health of the people. And then how are engineering solutions going to, to be developed and guided uh, with that in mind, and with specifically in mind with uh, products that are regulated by the FDA and have to be safe and effective and evaluated in that way. So that's my response. Back to you. Thanks. And Doug, did you have any um, comments for that question? Sure. Um, I think the most interesting thing is that um, my experience at the FDA, I've been here about a year and a half now, has been that people are looking for a change maker. They're looking for a catalyst. And that's not just at, at CDRH, that's across the industry. People want to talk. They, they, they want to co you know, collaborate and, and, and be co cooperative. They just don't know, there's no toehold to do it. Um, and so I, uh, Bill's point about keeping your eyes on the prize is absolutely important. And we don't need to have everybody in the loop. We just need to have a critical number. I don't need every single insured patient to comment every insurer to comment on things. I just need 50 million covered lives or 100 million covered lives. And once we get enough consensus together, everybody else will jump in because it'll be in their own self-interest to jump in. And that's that's been my experience today. Terrific. So D Doug, I've got a question for you. Um, when will these Sherpas be available? I mean, what you described is a um, program that I think a lot of people would want to take advantage of. And so, and the second part of that is, do you have enough human power? I mean, are there enough people working at CDRH to make that a reality? Because I know that uh, there's certainly a lot of unfilled positions broadly across the FDA. Uh, so if you could address those two issues, what, what time horizon do you have with regard to planning for the TAP program being rolled out? And secondly, do you, how, how difficult will it be to have the people to do it? Well, right now I'm working on my Michelle Tarver cloning machine, but it's slow going. <laughs> um, but um, it's interesting, you know, I, I'm reaching out a lot to industry and a lot to Silicon Valley and a bunch of my old colleagues and, and uh, the, the people that I work with across the kind of innovator startup community. And it's been stunning to me how many people are interested in working with FDA or at FDA. I've had um, very few people say they're just not interested. It's really, how, how can I get involved in a way where it's productive? Um, so 
in the end, I think at the end of the day, hiring the people is not going to be the issue. It takes time. It's really developing the processes and the SOPs inside of FTA. So we're all communicating with one another. So one person's not telling uh, an innovator something, and then somebody else is telling them something else. Um, that that's been the that's going to be the the biggest challenge. But we'll we'll do great. I mean, it's uh, and the plan is to. It's not available yet, but we'll start doing it in October of this year. That gives us time to, to staff up and, like I said, write all the protocols and any arrangements with the, with the payers, so, professional societies, and the, and, the, and the patient advocacy groups. So will people, uh, when they reach out to the FDA, will they be reaching out to do individual divisions or will TAP be housed separately? In other words, will you have TAP people, say you have an uh, a, a interest in health technology and you'd like to you know, engage a TAP person for that, would you go to a particular, that division or would you, would there be, would they go through your office and then they'd be connected with who the Sherpa would be? Well, in the beginning, TAP is gonna be available only to those companies with products that have breakthrough designation. Mm -hmm. And that will, uh, the first contacts with TAP will be at whatever OHT that you go to. And, and we'll be in contact really early on in that process, probably in the first meeting. And one more thing, we're going to, we'll roll it out one OHT at a time. And to do it at everything all at once would be like, you know, like trying to change the, the side of the street that people in England drive on. Um, you know, over time, it's, it would be hard. So instead, we're going we're gonna to bite the elephant, you know, eat the elephant one bite at a time and start with individual OHTs. Then over time, we'll, it'll eventually be rolled out to everybody. And then we'll make a decision as to whether it should go beyond breakthrough to, to other programs as well. There's, there's a there's a specific question from uh, on the chat uh, on uh, whether or not you have concerns, and this is really for Ed, but maybe you could answer it, Doug. Are there concerns that some of the tools that are developed for devices may uh, may not actually be good tools, or maybe misapplied? Uh, maybe they're good tools for a specific area, but could be misapplied. Uh, is there any concern about that at CDRH in terms of the tools themselves? Yeah. I'm going to turf that over to, to Ed. He's much smarter than me about that. <laughs> well, 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 we'll defer that. Michelle, do you have any questions for anybody um, right now? Sure. And actually, I'll, I'll touch very quickly on the medical device development tool program, which I think is being alluded on because that is actually one out of um, the office, um, out of our office. Um, I, I will say that the, the tool program, when they're qualified tools, they specify the context in which there's uh, to be applied. And so there are some limits on how much that qualification will, will apply. We do know that sometimes developing tools themselves can generate some innovation and innovative ideas and innovative applications. And so um, we encourage people to come talk to us if they have ideas about innovative tools so that we can uh, work with them to see what makes sense in a regulatory context. So the question that I actually have um, is a, a broad question and, and Bill and Doug, both of you, please feel free to answer. I know you've touched a lot on how the COVID-19 public health emergency has transformed not only the way that we work with other groups that may not traditionally be medical device developers, as well as finding more efficient ways to bring medical device into the public health's hands. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, as this public health emergency hopefully winds down, what are some of the things that we've done during the emergency that you think would really be beneficial for us to continue once it's come to a close so that we can continue to foster innovative um, uh, and efficient solutions for public health? And Bill, I'll, I'll start with you first if you have any ideas to that. Well, one of the things that, that our Cersei actually is uh, quite proud of is, is the way in which we engage uh, the various communities, academia, the corporate sector, uh, uh, FDA folks. And I think that there's a, a huge amount to be gained by um, just getting knowledge out into, into areas where uh, otherwise you don't see it. And so, for example, that's why we do the, the, it may be a little corny, but I think that the Who's Got Regulatory Science Talent Competition stimulates all sorts of creative thought and, and inspiring uh, and energetic students, undergraduates as well as graduate students. And if we could just propagate those things out there further, things like uh, emergency use authorizations, things like uh, clinical trial uh, decision points, those kinds of things. 
which is get out there and permeate the space so that the public is a more well-informed public. And so that when folks uh, like yourselves are trying to review new products, the things that come in to your offices are much more informed. And so there's less of this churn that needs to happen that uh, Doug talked about so effectively. Hopefully that'll uh, that answers that question a little bit. Terrific. So, it sh so a lot of questions related to TAP, um, and and one one I think maybe some, maybe summarizes um, you know a lot of a lot of several questions is what do you, what do you do now if you feel like some of the TAP principles are perhaps not being applied if you're say perhaps unhappy with a a, a decision or a pathway uh, is it best do you, does your are you uh, engaging these individuals outside of the or I'm sorry, engaging these companies outside the pro review processes that are going on. Uh, because otherwise, I know there's an appeal process, which is fairly formal, but, uh, but is there anything short of that where you could informally engage and try to get help uh, if you're, you know, if you're uh, innovating and you need, you feel like uh, you're not getting as much support as you'd like in the process? Doug, this is, this is one for you. The answer is yes. And, and who do you call? You're going to put your, your email address and phone number on this? No, you know, I, I, I get this question a lot, and I'm sorry, my internet connection says it's unstable, so I'm sorry if, it, if, I, if I freeze up here. But, um, you know, the 95% the of the problems people have with FDA is about communication, and it's about not being straightforward or not letting them know where you really are, what you really, what you really want to do, and what the resources you have and your constraints. And to the extent you're communicating with your reviewers and your review groups, I mean, my experience at FDA is that they really want to help you. They, they want you to have a successful product. They want you to do the right thing. But to the extent that you're, you know, you're being uh, um, secretive or don't really want to uh, let people know all the, all the data you have or you're, you're trying to hold stuff back, then it leaves us kind of like a therapist with a, with a recalcitrant patient who's trying to, you know, who's kind of telling you the world the way they see it, but they're not giving you all the data. It's really hard to help them unless they're being completely open. Yeah. So I had, I've, I've had friends and colleagues who were having issues at FDA and, and, uh, and they were concerned about the way their relationship had been going. And I said, just go want to, you know, exactly what you want and be straightforward. It's like any relationship, any business relationship, it's a much better relationship when you are straightforward and comprehensive. And, um, and that's gonna continue whether it's TAP or not. Um, TAP is just gonna be the next level of that. So you no, know, the a lot of the tools we've developed uh, with TAP that are, that are gonna be, like I said, be available in October, were really developed from the COVID response, which was in more informalized communication. Um, Cause you can't have 400,000 inbound inquiries uh, uh, you know, about um, uh, COVID-related products for a group as small as ours and have these overly formal you know, communication methodologies. It just doesn't work. So uh, it, things have already changed a lot just in the past year and a half, two years, um, much to the benefit of developers. Um, but they're going to change a lot more as, as we get this up and running. And um, so, I don't know, Michelle, if you have anything else to say. Terrific. So, I'm, so I have a question for both you, Doug and Michelle. Um, and because, you know, Michelle, obviously you have a longstanding experience at CDRH. And uh, this, the question relates to communication. And now I already know the answer to this question, but I'm asking it anyway. Uh, and, and the question is, if, you, if you're an innovator and, or you maybe have a small company with an idea uh, and a, say a medical device, uh, and you don't have a lot of money, but you're told that you have to go to a regulatory expert to communicate with the FDA, because if you talk, talk directly to the FDA, things may not go well. And so they, these cottage industries that have built up where these people charge huge amounts of money to small companies to sort of be the go-betweens uh, in communicating with the FDA. Uh, is there value for that type of expertise early on, or, uh, or should, should you go right to the FDA early and say, hey, uh, what do I need to do? Is there some benefit? to direct communication as, uh, as opposed to through an intermediary. So Doug, this if you don't mind, I, I could start and then turn it over to you. 
I'd say come directly to us. I get emails all the time where people ask me a very general question where they're not at a point yet where they need a formal um, insights, but they just want to kind of know where should they start. I'm, I get on the phone with them. Um, and, and we, I think you will find that many people at FDA are very willing to have a conversation. You don't need an intermediary to have that initial conversation. And sometimes it can create a lot of efficiencies in your process because what type of intermediary you need in terms of developing what kind of evidence or anything else that's necessary for your particular product development may be informed by that initial conversation. So for small companies that have limited resources, they can make a better estimation or calculation of where to attribute those resources. Um, FDA is not a, a scary place, I would say. We are warm, open, friendly, and want to see helpful products at the U.S. market. Um, and so if we can help, we're happy to help. And, and, I, and, I, know. and, and I can say that what Michelle's saying is absolutely true. I've seen this over and over again. FDA gives you direct answers. There's no need to be intimidated in asking questions. And, and of course, you always have to keep in mind that many of these intermediaries work, get paid by the hour. So it's not in their interest uh, to necessarily have a straightforward process in terms of responding to you. And, 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 uh, and sometimes things that could be very straightforward can become much more complex if you're working through an intermediary. So please pick up the phone and call. You have to keep call CDRH directly. Go ahead, Doug, you and, had some comments. And, and cool, Doug, the, the other issue is that um, I've, I've used a bunch of really great um, regulatory consultants in the past, and I've worked with some really terrible ones because they tend to be utilized, and it's not, not all their fault, but a lot of them tend to be out of date, and a lot of them tend to be very tactical and not strategic. Because keep in mind, regulatory, regulatory risk is it's just a small subsection of business risk. Perfect information is, is infinitely expensive, and uh, you can't make good strategic decisions unless you have good information. And clin your clinical plan and what you need to develop that, that's all part of that, that, that business risk you're going to take on. You know, when do I hire my, my, my sales reps? And when do I do this and that? That can't be done until you really have an understanding of what your clinical protocol is and ultimately what your product is going to be and how you're going to sell it. What, you know, what, to get a tools indication for a lot of devices sometimes works, and that gets you through the FTA pretty quickly. But for the vast majority of things, knowing what you're, you're selling, knowing what the stakeholders think about it, doing a more extensive clinical study, um, while it seems more risky, at the end of the day, is much more likely to produce um, a much broader adoption and much more of a hockey stick um, uh, adoption in the real world, which is what you want to see. And if you're looking to get your company acquired, that's what all the acquirers want to see. They don't want to take on all the risk that there's no business there because you did some tiny study or didn't include any patients in it. Um, so you got to think a little bit more holistically about your business and where the clinical stuff fits and where the FDA fits in it. And we want to be your partner to create that, that body of evidence that makes you super successful. So let us, let us do that. And that, sometimes that involves just give Michelle a call. Now I'll give you every her phone number later. I get her, her home phone's the easiest place to get that. <laughs> well, this has been, a, we're actually at time. I'm going to turn it over to Michelle in, in case she has any uh, concluding comments uh, to uh, end the session. It's been a fabulous discussion. Thank you. Special thanks to all the speakers and uh, and uh, panel discussion has been, been terrific. Michelle? I just want to echo what you said, called up. I think it's been really informative to hear about the ways in which we can use innovative approaches to really help improve um, public health and make efficiencies in regulatory science. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you for your great questions from the audience. Sorry we couldn't get to all of them. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at 1.30 for the uh, joining everybody in the, in the main room.